Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two in our series on presenting your research. We're going to be talking about writing papers in our field. To start, let's look at the outline of a typical NLP paper. By and large, these are either four or eight page papers in a two column format that you get from the style sheets. Those lengths don't include the references. And there are a bunch of conventions for how the papers are typically organized. So you have your title and abstract on page one. And usually you have an intro section that kind of fits on that first page, maybe a little bit onto the second. In place two, you discuss the related work or prior literature or background that's needed to kind of contextualize the work that you're doing. Then there's typically a data section, followed by a section on a model, or this could be thought of as the kind of core proposal section of the paper. Then there'll be some methods related to the experiments, a reporting of the results of the experiments, and then some analysis of what the experimental results mean, and then possibly a short conclusion. It's not set in stone that you have to follow these conventions, but if you do follow them, I think it will be easier on your readers and also easier on you as a writer because you can kind of slot your ideas into this familiar format. Let's look at those sections in a little bit of, uh, of detail. So starting with the intro, the ideal intro to my mind really tells the full story of your paper at a high level. We don't need all the details, but it is very helpful to know from beginning to end what the paper accomplishes. And good intros provide all of that information and really tell the reader precisely what they'll learn as they go through the rest of the paper. In place two, as I said, is the discussion of background material or related work or prior literature. And this is an opportunity for you to contextualize your work and provide insights into the major themes of the literature as a whole. What you should really be thinking about doing is using each paper or each theme that you identify as a chance to kind of contextualize your ideas and especially articulate what's special about the contribution that you're making. So this kind of sets the stage for the reader. The data section, this could vary a lot. This could be very detailed if you're offering a new data set or using a data set in some unfamiliar way that the community's not used to. But of course, if you're just adopting some data off the shelf, then this section might be pretty short. Then you get to the heart of your proposal, your model. Um, you'll wanna flesh out your own approach and really help us understand your core contribution. Then we turn to supporting your ideas with some experimental evidence. You'll report the methods, your experimental approach, including descriptions of the metrics. And again, that will be long or short depending on whether the metrics are familiar or unfamiliar. You wanna describe your baseline models and anything else that's relevant to kind of understanding precisely what's gonna happen in your experiments. I will say that for details about hyperparameters and optimization choices and so forth, you can probably move those to an appendix unless they're really central to the argument. What you wanna offer here are kind of the crucial pieces that will help the reader understand precisely what you did for your experiments. Then we get our results. This could be a no-nonsense report of what happened. It's probably mainly gonna be supported by figures and tables that report a summary of your core findings according to your data, models, and metrics. And then things open up a bit. You have an analysis section. I think this is really important. You should articulate for the reader what your results mean, what they don't mean, where they can be approved, where their limits are, and so forth, right? These sections vary a lot depending on the nature of the paper and the findings, but I think they're always important and they can be very rewarding. It is intimidating because this is awfully open-ended, um, but I'm hoping that the previous unit on analysis methods in our field offer some really good general purpose tools and techniques for doing rich analyses of this sort and really helping us understand precisely what you accomplished. Now, this is, as, as I said, is not set in stone and different projects will call for different variants on it. And one really prominent variant that you see is that if you have multiple experiments with multiple data sets, you might want to repeat that methods results analysis rhythm across all of your experiments to give them kind of separate sections in your paper. But again, it really depends on what you think the most natural way to express your ideas is. These things aren't set in stone, they're just conventions that help us as readers and as authors. And then finally, you have a conclusion. This is probably a quick summary of what the paper did, and then an opportunity for you to chart out future directions that you or others might pursue. So it's a chance to be more outward looking and expansive. Let me close the screencast with some general advice on scientific writing that I think can be helpful kind of in the background as you think about expressing your ideas. 
First, I just wanna um, review this really nice piece from Stuart Schieber, where he advocates for what he calls the rational reconstruction approach to scientific writing. And to build up to that, he offers two contrasting styles that you might think about. The first is what he calls the continental style. This is in which one states the solution with as little introduction or motivation as possible, sometimes not even saying what the problem was. And he says, readers will have no clue as to whether you're right or, or not without incredible efforts and close reading of the paper, but at least they'll think you're a genius. At the other end of the extreme here, you have what he calls the historical style. And this is a whole history of false starts, wrong attempts, near misses, redefinitions of the problem. Um, this is a kind of genuine history of maybe the struggles that you endured as you built up to the final product for your paper. And, and Schieber says, this is much better than the continental style because a careful reader can probably follow the line of reasoning that the author went through and use this as motivation. But the reader will probably think you're a bit addle-headed. We don't need to hear about every dead end and every false start. What we would like rather is what Schieber calls the rational reconstruction. You don't present the actual history that you went through, but rather an idealized history that perfectly motivates each step in the solution. You might selectively choose models that you abandoned as a way of helping the, the reader understand how you built toward your actual core set of methods and findings and results. So it's gonna be a kind of streamlined version of that historical style. The goal in pursuing the rational reconstruction style is not to convince the reader that you're brilliant or addle-headed for that matter, but that your solution is trivial. Schieber says it takes a certain strength of character to take that as one's goal, right? The goal of writing a really excellent paper is that the reader comes away thinking that was clear and obvious and even I could have done it. That's an act of genuine communication uh, and it does take a strength of character, but in the end, this is what we should all be striving for, this kind of really clear and open communication. This is also a nice document from David Goss. He has um, some hints on mathematical style. There's a bunch of low level details in there, especially related to presenting very formal work. The piece that I wanted to pull out is just have mercy on the reader. This is again, recalling the rational reconstruction approach that Schieber advocated for, where you're really thinking about what it's like to be a reader, encountering the ideas for the first time and genuinely trying to understand what you accomplished. You have to really think about what it's like to be in that position in order to have a successful and clear paper. I also really like this piece from the novelist Cormac McCarthy, which he published in Nature. It's full of great advice. The one piece that I wanted to highlight is this. McCarthy says, decide on your paper's theme and two or three points you want every reader to remember. This theme and these points form the central thread that runs through your piece. The words, sentences, paragraphs, and sections are the needlework that holds it together. If something isn't needed to help the reader understand the main theme, omit it. And this is helpful to me because I think it not only results in a better paper, but it will also be easier for you to write your paper because the themes you choose will determine what to include and exclude and resolve a lot of low-level questions about your narrative. And conversely, I've often found that when I'm really struggling to write a paper, it's because I haven't figured out what these core themes are and I'm kind of casting about unsure of what's relevant and what's irrelevant. And if you step back and really figure out what you're trying to communicate, then the act of writing uh, kind of all falls into place. And then the final bit of advice that I wanted to offer, which I'm gonna to return to when we, when we talk about presenting work at conferences, this comes from Patrick Blackburn. It's about talks, but it really extends to any kind of communication in science. His fundamental insight, he asks, where do good talks, and I think good papers, where do they come from? And he says, honesty. A good talk or a good paper should never stray far from simple, honest communication. And you can hear this in the way that we talk about evaluating your work, that fundamentally for us, we're looking for papers that offer open, clear, honest communication about what happened and what it means. And that's like really a fundamental value. And I think it's inspiring to think about this as your kind of guiding light when you report your scientific results to the community.